Hello everyone, my name is Daniel Skelton and I am the pastor of a United Methodist Church and it's a blessing to be able to share this reflection with you wherever you are in whatever you happen to be doing. I hope your day has been blessed and that you have been able to enjoy the early spring-like weather lately, at least where I'm from. It's been in the upper 50s. Um, the day I'm recording this is supposed to be in the lower 60s. So we are experiencing an early spring and it's only February and it's a blessing to be able to, to experience that and to see the sun shining. So I hope um, you're able to experience the same thing. If not, um, I pray that you will someday be able to experience the spring-like weather and to see God's creation come um, colorfully to life. But anyway, I, I hope your day has been going well, and I hope you are doing well also. I will have to tell you, it has been absolutely wonderful to see the sun shining here in Oblong. After several days of rain and fog and gray clouds, seeing the sun has been a good reminder that even in seasons of darkness, there is still a light shining, and that light is Jesus Christ. I often like to think that on, glo on gloomy days, and it's gray, and it's cloudy, it's just miserable outside, then when we see the sun shining, that's a reminder that uh, Christ is looking out over us and saying, you know what? You've been in the darkness for this amount of time. Now it's time to experience the light and just feel rejuvenated. So I'm really blessed to see the sunshine. You could probably see it now. My window is over here. Uh, and the sun is shining in. So it's been a, a beautiful morning so far. I don't even have the lights on in the office. Um, so I'm just really thankful for this sun and, and the reminder that Jesus Christ is in my life. And and as Frank Sinatra sang in 1941, blue skies smiling at, smiling at me, nothing but blue skies do I see. And hopefully that comes true as we get closer to spring. So I hope you continue to see blue skies in your days. I want to thank you for taking the time to tune in and to join me for uh, this week's reflection. I bet there are other things, millions of things you could be doing right now besides listening to this reflection and tuning in and, and learning a little bit more about God and how God is working in your life. Um, but you have chosen to join me, and so I'm totally thankful for that and blessed by your presence. So thank you for spending 30 to 40 minutes uh, with me this week. Uh, as you get settled in, I invite you to do two things for me. Uh, first, if you have a candle nearby, I invite you to go ahead and light that candle. Go ahead and light that uh, candle. Uh, that candle is a reminder that Christ is in your life, He's in, and he's and he's in this space and place where you are. Uh, so light that can light. So let the light of Christ shine brightly in your life. So if you have a candle nearby, I, I encourage you to go ahead and light that as a reminder that Christ is with you, um, and he's in this space and his place, and he's um, with us during our reflection as a reminder that he is listening and he is watching over us. Uh, the second thing that I invite you to do, as, as some of you are, are accustomed to doing, is simply leave a comment in the comment section. You can, simply, you can simply say hello, you can leave a prayer request, you can let me know how your day is going, how your week's going, if you have any exciting plans for this upcoming weekend, uh, maybe, or you can let me know if, you, if what Puxatani Phil um, predicted last week of an early spring is what you believe in. And, and if not, you can let me know uh, that you don't believe in. Maybe you don't believe in the predictions of Puxatani Phil. Um, so, uh, it's fun to think about those things. Uh, so, uh, he did not see his shadow, which means there's going to be an early spring, um, which, you know, <laughs> from his prediction, we are having here in Oblong, um, but the winter is not over yet. So we got to give some uh, flexibility to that. So you can let me know if you agreed with Punxsutawney Phil's prediction or not, or if you didn't even pay attention to it. Um, so you can go ahead and leave a comment uh, in that, or you may comment on anything that I may share with you during our time together. If you would like, you can leave a comment to this question, as I often like to uh, ask a question up front is, how have you ever conquered any giants? Have you ever conquered any giants in your life with a slingshot or a stone? Meaning, have you ever um, conquered any giants in your life with just simple things? And, and not with armor, not with a sword, or not with anything powerful, but just something simple. If you are thinking about the story of David and Goliath after hearing that question, especially the giant, the slingshot, and stone, um, you are on the right track. During our time together, we will be briefly reflecting on the story of David and Goliath, a famous story we heard as children, but has a profound lesson for us adults. So there's going to be three lessons that I want to share with you um, at the end of this reflection. But what does the story of David and Goliath teach you today? You know, when you think about that story, what does it teach you? When you thought, when you first heard it as a child, what do you think? What did you focus on? What caught your attention? Um, it's fascinating to see where we were and where we've gone when we think about Bible stories that have been with us 
for many, many years. So go ahead, if you wouldn't mind, leave a comment to that question. You know, what does the story of David and Goliath teach you today? Uh, so with all that being said, let's begin our time in a moment of prayer. So if you're able and willing, please pray with me. Dear God, as we prepare to reflect on your stories, may our ears be open to your lessons and our minds open to your word. Help us to witness your strength in the presence of our own giants and guide us to be like David, trusting in your word, O Lord. Bless our time together and all those who join. In your heavenly name we pray. Amen. Amen. So what does the story of David and Goliath teach you? When you first heard about David and Goliath, what stood out to you? Before we answer these questions, it's important to remind ourselves of who Goliath is and who David is and about the story of David and Goliath. So I'm just going to spend a few minutes just giving you some background about who Goliath was and who David was and kind of give a brief summary of the story of David and Goliath. It's a rather long story in 1 Samuel 17. I think it's it's got to be over 50 verses, 58 stands in my mind, but um, I, don't quote me on that. But it's a rather long story because there's a lot in there to unpack. So I'm just going to give you a brief summary. And in addition to that, like I said, I'm going to just inform you about who Goliath is and, and who David is. Um, it's imp two important characters to know because we need to know where they're coming from and kind of where they're going. So first, in 1 Samuel 17, where we read about David and Goliath, we encounter Goliath for the first time. Goliath is a Philistine giant in the Philistine army. All right, so he's part of this army, and we know the Philistines did not really care for the Israelites. So that's who they're going up against. David is an Israelite, and here we are. Philistines are getting ready for a battle to fight the Israelites, uh, to conquer them, and to make them their slaves. Um, uh, Goliath states, uh, and, and, and I'll paraphrase here that he says, if you defeat me, we, meaning the Philistines will become your servants, but if we defeat you, you will forever be our servants. So, um, you know, there's, there's some animosity going on here. There's some, um, taunting going on with the, with the Goliath. Um, but this is the first time we meet him and he's a giant and he's on the Philistine side. So first Samuel 17 verse four states that he is a champion from Gath. So he's not only just a giant in the army, but he's a champion, right? I mean, just put those things together and it makes sense. If you were a giant back in those days, or even today, you would probably be a champion because you would overpower anything or anyone that came across your path, right? Nobody's going to stand up to you. Nobody's going to want to fight you. Nobody's going to want to face you. They're all going to do the opposite. They're going to run. They're going to turn their backs towards you and say, adios, see you later. You win. Have a good day. It's no wonder he's a champion. No matter what fight he enters, he's going to win. He's going to win. He's a champion. Later on in the same verse, uh, we are given a physical description of Goliath. His height was six cubits in span. When we studied the story of Noah and the ark a few weeks ago, we learned that a cubit is from the bottom of your elbow, the bottom of your elbow, to the tip of your tallest finger. That's a cubit. And we know this varies from person to person. So, you know, if they were building any projects, they wanted the same person there every day so that that same person had the same measuring length. They didn't want to call on call on uh, um, um, Job one day and then say, you know, and Job calls in sick and says, oh, we're going to call on Adam the next day and have him finish the project. No, because their lengths could uh, differ and that could throw off the whole project. So a cubit is from the bottom of your elbow to the tip of your tallest finger. And, and Goliath was six cubits in span. The average cubit length during David's time was 19.5 to 21.5 inches. Right? Which could vary here. So most scholars say that Goliath is anywhere from 9 to 10 feet tall. 9 to 10 feet tall. This, this is a giant, right? This is a giant. 9 to 10 feet tall. To give you a reference, NBA basketball hoops are located 10 feet off the ground. And a typical one-story home is 12 to 13 feet tall. So Goliath, so Goliath could can touch the rim with both feet on the ground. I mean, all he had to do was just reach over and dunk it. He didn't even have to jump. He didn't have to run to build up momentum to jump. He could just stand there and dunk it in. So he could stand on the on on two feet on the ground, and his head would reach the rim of the basketball hoop. And he can, and he can reach as high as a one-story house. He's already nine to ten feet tall, and just imagine how high he could reach. He's reaching taller than a one-story building. He's a big guy. This is a, this is a giant. So, so 
you know, if we think about this, furthermore, he he's not only tall, but he's probably built. He's he's buff. He's muscular. He wore a coat of chainmail of bronze weighing 5,000 shekels or 125 pounds. Goliath was certainly a strong giant. And when I think of 125 pounds, you know, there are some people out there that that's no problem for them. 125 pounds, that's nothing. They could put something on that's 125 pounds and, and go the whole day with no problem. They can lift 125 pounds, no problem. But there's others of us that say 125 pounds, that's crazy. That's crazy. That's heavy. You know, when I was in marching band in high school, uh, I, I marched drum line. And so I carried a bass drum that had a harness and then attached to that was a bass drum. And then I, I played snare for two years and had a harness and the snare. And then I, I, I played tenors uh, for my last year in high school. And, you know, those things have weight, you know, uh, from the bass drum to the tenor drums and the tenor drums had multiple drums. And then you were looking at anywhere from, you know, uh, 30 to possibly 45 pounds that I'm carrying on my body, you know, during rehearsals, that's a long time. You know, we had what were called three a days. And then that was, you know, three hours in the morning, an hour for lunch, three hours in the afternoon, an hour for dinner and three hours in the evening. So in a span, you know, I could be carrying that drum, you know, that's nine hours, maybe, probably maybe six, six, seven, six to seven hours of those nine hours, I was carrying that drum around. Right, that's heavy. That's a lot of weight to to carry. And and Goliath was carrying 125 pounds, no problem. So he is tall and he is strong. Lastly, did you know Goliath had a brother? In First Chronicles chapter chapter 20 verse 5, in Second Samuel verse uh, chapter 21 verse 19, we read, "In another battle with the Philistines, Elahana, son of Jar, killed Lahami, the brother of Goliath. Lahami is the brother of Goliath." The Gittite, who had a spear and a shaft like a weaver's rod. In 1 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 6, we read about a huge man with six fingers on each hand. But we are unclear if this huge man is a relative of Goliath. If he is, then Goliath has a descendant of Rapha in 1 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 8. So you never really thought about, I've never really thought about, you know, or even asked the question, does Goliath have siblings? Are there more giants during this time? And apparently there were. How many? I don't know. I, I, there, there's at least one that's been named. There could be two that's, that's a huge man that has six fingers on each hand. So there's at least one other giant besides Goliath that was floating around during this time. But there's a little bit about Goliath. He's tall, he's strong, he's got some siblings. Now, what about David? Who is David? David was from the tribe of Judah, which included the town of Jerusalem. David was Ruth and Boaz's great-grandson and, and the son of Jesse. David was the youngest of seven brothers, which means he was not in a privileged position according to the lineage authority during this time period. Mostly the, older, the oldest son had the most authority. That's the one that's going to carry on the name, carry on the legacy of their father. And then after that, the kind of the authority dwindled. And if you were the last son, you really didn't have a lot of privilege or authority unless something happened to your um, to your elders. Um, so David was just, he was the youngest. He was probably a little bit ignored, not really favored, not really looked upon, given random tasks that the other siblings didn't want to do. David was from the town of Bethlehem, which we've heard before, which explains why Bethlehem is referred to as the town of David in the Gospel of Luke. David was... God's anointed one who was anointed by Samuel, set aside for a specific purpose. From that day on, the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. 1 Samuel chapter 16. He, we also read that David was a shepherd who took care of the family sheep and scared off lions and bears and tigers. Oh my, not tigers, just lion and bears. I had to throw that in there from the Wizard of Oz. David was also a musician, right? He played the harp or a similar instrument to that. Saul's servants believed a musician would help soothe Saul whenever the spirit came to torment him. So there we go. We have David. David was a giant slayer and a great warrior who slain tens of thousands compared to King Saul's merely thousands, right? David was great. He, he, he slayed more than the king, which in, in retrospect probably makes sense because the king has uh, soldiers to do his work out in the field. So that kind of makes sense. But you know, begs the question, how much did King Saul fight before he became king? And how involved was he in the battles that he may have encountered? It seems like David is the greater warrior in this sense. 
David is known for being Israel's greatest king. But as king, he was not a perfect person. David committed adultery with Bathsheba and then plotted to have Uriah, the husband of Bathsheba, killed. David succeeded. We, we read in 1 Samuel chapter 13 that David was a man after God's own heart. He even lamented when his son didn't live. Lastly, David is said to be the author of about 73 of the 150 Psalms. So, in retrospect, in summary, David was a shepherd. He was anointed. He was not in a privileged position within his family, was a great king and fighter, and was not perfect and was a man after God's own heart. Fascinating, right? We really don't take the time to really think about the story of David, where he came from, what he did, and what he ended up doing. And we know that he was favored by God, he was anointed, but he wasn't perfect by any means, right? He committed adultery, he even had somebody killed because he didn't want that person to find out about what he was doing. He struggled as a king, emotionally, physically, spiritually, mentally. But yet God still anointed him. He saw something in that shepherd boy that would help change the Israelites in the future. So now that we know a little bit about David and Goliath, let me remind you of that famous story that involves both of them. According to 1 Samuel chapter 17, David was the youngest son of Jesse, a man of Bethlehem, and served as a shepherd for his father before beginning his career as an aide to the court of Saul, Israel's first king. Probably playing, uh, excuse me, probably playing his instrument for him to soothe him when the, the spirit tormented him. When Israel came into conflict with the Philistines, a people from a neighboring region, David's brothers went to fight for King Saul, leaving David alone to maintain the family business. Young David would travel back and forth to the camp to bring his brothers food and supplies. According to 1 Samuel 17, Goliath, a heavenly armed Philistine giant, challenged Saul for 40 days to send out a man to fight him. And I'll stop there real quick. 40 is very significant and important in the Bible. Just a couple of reference, references, right? Uh, in the story of Noah, it rained 40 days and 40 nights. Jesus was tempted in the desert for 40 days. <clears throat> the Israelites wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. So this number 40 keeps coming up in the Bible, it's, and it's specific and um, it's significant, rather. And we need to pay attention to where that number uh, comes up and what's going on around that number, because it could correlate. All these instances could correlate. If we think about, you know, what's going on here? What are these people experiencing? What are what were they emotionally challenged with? How is their spirit? Where is their faith? And so here we are with this another 40. And, and on top of all this, Goliath, who is this champion, all he had to do was come out and wipe out the Israelites. I mean, they're afraid of him already. So what's the point of prolonging this battle? But for 40 days, he steps out in front of the Israelites, in front of King Saul, and challenges King Saul to send him a man that would fight him. Nobody wants to fight Goliath. He does this for 40 days until David steps up and volunteers himself. But for 40 days, there's this constant message, hey, come fight me or else. But there, where's the or else? There's nothing, right? For 40 days, he says the same thing when he could just conquer the Israelites and be done with it. Why does he wait 40 days? I don't know. But maybe it's because God had a plan and God has a hand in this from the very beginning. But either way, it's it's okay to ask that question. Why would, why would the Philistines wait? Why would Goliath wait? I mean, this is their opportunity. They could seize the moment. They have a giant on their side. All they have to do is let the giant go out and do his thing. And they're fine. They're going to have a lot of servants. They're going to have a lot of Israelite servants coming back with them. But yet, they waited 40 days. No one would face the warrior until David, armed only with a slingshot and five stones, and absent of Saul's armor, volunteered himself. David hit the giant in the forehead with a, with a stone and killed him. David was victorious because of his faith and trust in God. Now, the story continues to go on, and we learn there's some gruesome things that happen after David kills the giant. You know, he cuts his head off. He carries the head around and takes it to another place. He captures or 
takes hold of the giant's armor. So there's a lot of things that happen under this. I just gave you the children's ending of the story. Uh, David defeated Goliath with a stone and Goliath died. Um, but that's kind of a brief summary of the story. And it's a good reminder for us to think about as now we go into thinking about what we may have paid attention to as a child when we first heard the story and how the story has changed um, for us today. And so do you remember what you thought about when you first heard the story of David and Goliath? When I heard this story as a child, <clears throat> I was fascinated by the fact that a young boy, a shepherd, maybe like me and about my height, conquered a giant. As a child, Goliath wasn't nine feet tall, but twice the size of my house and about 20 feet tall. Man, you know, about 20 feet tall and could touch the top of the tallest tree in the yard. That's who Goliath was. Goliath just wasn't a 10-foot giant. Goliath was a giant giant. He was taller than my house. He, was, he could reach higher than the tree. He was probably taller than the trees in my yard. That's how big giant that Goliath was to me as a boy. I was small. I was itty-bitty. And, and I was relating to David. David was a boy. He was young. He could have been like me. And I could have been like David. Going up this giant that, you know, could reach the heavens and, and touch the stars. That's what I envisioned as a child when I heard this story. I loved the fact that David only used a slingshot and a stone to take down Goliath. Because I had those things. I had access to stones. I had access to a slingshot. I love this because I had a slingshot and there were stones around my house. And I was not a good aim. I couldn't even hit a pop can from two feet away with a slingshot. David was young like me, about my height, and used things that I, would, that I had access to. That's how I related to, to David. As a song about David suggests, only a boy named David, only a boy like me. He was like me. That's how I could relate to the story. As a child, I learned that the story of David and Goliath is a story about having faith in God in trusting God, and listening to what God is calling us to do. Also, this story provides the message that even young and small children can do great things. As much as these messages still are still true today, there are at least three other messages I would like to share with you now, and there's many more. There's more than three messages we can take away from the story of David and Goliath, um, there's more because it relates to our life in different phases of our life. We could read it today and get something out of it. We could read it tomorrow and get something new. We could read the same story for a solid month and get something new out of it every day we read that story. That's how powerful the Word of God is because it's always working in our life. As Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 reminds us, the Word of God is alive and active. It's alive and active because it challenges us every day. It, it invites us to be involved in the story. It encourages us to really take note of those words and to relate those words back to our own life. So, here are three lessons that kind of sit with me every time I read this story. And here's the first one. First, so the story of David and Goliath teaches us about faith, trust, and listening to God's voice. In order to overcome trials and tribulations and setbacks, or when we backslide, according to use, to, to use the terminology of John Wesley, we have to have faith. We have to have faith. We have to have faith strong enough to help us face whatever life throws at us, even when others don't believe in us. So we have to have faith. David had faith. He volunteered himself to go up the, against this giant with no armor, just a slingshot and a stone. He had faith. And because of that faith, he did the impossible. He defeated that giant. He defeated an entire army with one stone and one slingshot. In addition to faith, we need to have trust in, in the Lord, right? So Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5, trust in the Lord with all your heart and mind, right? Trust in the Lord and not on your own understanding. Trust in the Lord that he will guide you through whatever is weighing us down or keeping us from committing to Christ. With trust, we give everything to God, right? We give everything to God. We should give everything to God, knowing that he will help us to see the light at the end of the tunnel. Lastly, when we have faith, not only in God, but also ourselves. And we trust God with all our heart, mind, and soul. We begin to open ourselves up to the voice of God and God's directions and plans. David had faith. 
David had trust and David listened to God and something no Israelite warrior was able to do. Defeat Goliath. Now, listening to God is very hard. I want to go back on this just for a moment um, because it is tough to listen to God all the time. There are other voices telling us what to do, what we should do. There are voices that are putting us down, telling us we're not doing a good job. There are voices that all they want to do is just bring us down, tear us down piece by piece. Sometimes it's the voices within ourselves that are the ones that are putting us down. And we need to do a lot more of listening to God than listening to others because God really knows who we are. Others may think they know who we are based on how we behave and what we think and, and how we perceive things. But God is the ultimate one who knows us. And he's the one that sh we should really be listening to because his word is truly a light unto our path and a lamp upon our feet. His voice is our light. And that light can conquer anything in our life. So make sure you really listen to God this week. So the second thing uh, that we can focus on or draw out of this text is, speaking of giants, we have all faced or have giants in our life. Something or someone bigger than us, right? Like the lions and dens found in the story of Daniel, these giants sometimes battles, sometimes struggles, sometimes contemplations, or sometimes lingering disagreements have a way to push us away from Christ. However, unlike the story of Daniel, the giants in our life don't always want to devour us or put us in dark places, but they do most of the time challenge us. When they challenge us, we become stressed, frustrated, anxious, worried, maybe a little depressed. And we find ourselves weak physically, emotionally, and spiritually. But we must remember that God is not going to give us a giant we can't handle. We might not be able to handle it on our own. But that is why God never forsakes or abandons us. What sort of giants, right? What sort of giants are you facing today? What is something that is challenging you that, that feels as if it is t towering over you, overshadowing you? We all have giants. We, all, we also have something that those giants don't have. We have God and the presence of Christ by our side. So yeah, we all have giants, don't we? We really do. We face challenges every day. We feel like we're tiny compared to other people, especially when people constantly put us down and dwindle us down and push us further into the ground. We all have giants. Again, they could be something, they could be someone. But what we have is what giants don't have, and we have God. We have God to lift us up, to build us back up, and to, and to really whisper in our ears, you can do it. Don't give up. That giant is nothing. Giant is nothing when I'm by your side. So if you have any giants that you're facing today, I invite you just to, you know, to invite God to help you with those giants. Simply say, pray, Lord, help me. Lord, grant me the strength to face these giants. Lord, give me the patience, the endurance to face these giants. Lord, simply be with me as I face these giants. Don't let those giants tear you down and destroy your faith and belief in God but allow those giants to put more belief in God and to build up your faith because that's what's needed to overcome the giants in your life. So if you have any giants, I'm praying for you. I'm here for you. And I know God is listening and Christ is by your side. The third lesson that we can take from this stands, the third lesson that stands out to me is what I didn't learn as a child when reading about David and Goliath. And that lesson is God gives us what we need to take down the giants in our life. God gives us what we need to take down the giants in our life. In 1 Samuel, we read that Saul offered David his armor, but it was too big for David and it caused David to stumble. So David didn't use it, which is uncharacteristic of any warrior at that time. 
David, a young shepherd boy, was not used to wearing armor. However, David was used to using what God provided him, a slingshot and a stone. In life, sometimes I feel as if I need the armor when I really don't, right? Ephesians chapter 6 tells us all about putting on the armor of God, you know, having the, the shield, the, um, the chest protector, the shoes, the helmet, the sword, right? All these elements, but those physical elements also represent something that lives within us. They represent, they, they, they represent the faith, the salvation, the gospel, the good word, the, the word of the spirit, right? They're not just physical things, but they're, they're more internal things that go with us. So when it talks about putting on the armor of God, it's not really talking about the physical armor. It's, it's talking about putting on the words of Christ, those promises that live within us today and every day, those things that Christ gives us as free gifts, salvation and faith and, and, and the word of him. So in life, sometimes I feel as if I need the armor when I really don't, the physical armor. What I mean by this is sometimes I think I need more of something instead of remembering that God has already given me more than enough to accomplish what he needs me to accomplish. In life, we always want more, not less. But with God, less is more. David had all that he needed to defeat Goliath, a slingshot, a stone, and God. Consider the fact that David grabbed five stones. Remember that? David grabbed a slingshot and five stones. He didn't grab one stone. He grabbed five stones from the wadi. Five stones. But he only used one to bring down the giant. Even David, without the armor, had more than enough. He had more than enough to defeat Goliath. He could have picked up one stone instead of five, and that would have been just fine. It will be tough not to want more. But when it comes to God, God has given you more than enough to do what he is calling you to do. It's hard sometimes to think that way. It's hard to just let that sink in. But it's true. It is true. God has given you more than enough to do what he has called you to do, even to fight those giants in your life. Sometimes when we pick up five stones, all, all we need is one stone. And that one stone will make the difference we've been seeking. The story of David and Goliath is certainly a story for the ages, absolutely. It reminds us of what faith and trust can do when we face giants in our life. It reminds us that we that we do have giants in our life. It's sad, but it's true. The story reminds us that we are facing giants. And it teaches us that with God in our life, we have what is needed to overcome the giants before us. What does the story of David and Goliath teach you? What stands out to you in this story? Who are you in the story of David and Goliath? Are you David? Are you King Saul? Are you Jesse? David's father? Are you David's brothers who are constantly putting other, maybe putting others down? Are you part of the Israelite army who is confused and scared of the giants before you and, and wondering, how is this little boy going to save us? Maybe you're a giant. Maybe you're a giant to someone. Maybe your words have constantly been putting someone down instead of lifting them up. So what does the story of David and Goliath teach you? Who are you in the story? And what is God trying to teach you? With that in mind, let's close our time together in a moment of prayer. So please pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you first and foremost for the light in our world, for the light in our life, which is your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Because of this light, we can truly face the giants before us. We can stand firm before them with two feet on the ground, with our hands on our hips and saying words, as David said, the giants come at me with swords and spears and all these weapons, but Lord, I come before the giants with your word in my heart and with your faith in my footsteps. Lord, that's what we need. We need to put down our weapons and we need to focus on your faith and give you trust and listen to you when we face any battle in our life. 
Lord, it's your words that are going to get us through those moments. It's your words that's going to build us up. It's your words that's going to give us the confidence and the strength we seek. It's your words that are going to be with us as we face those giants and learn to overcome them. Lord, I ask that you be with everyone who listens to this reflection, that you help them get through any giants that they are facing, and that you remove their fear and remind them that you are with them. As Isaiah says, you are here to help us and support us and guide us and uphold us by your victorious right hand. Lord, that's what we need in life when we face those giants. We need help, we need support, we need guidance, and we need your victorious right hand so that we can see victory in Jesus. So Lord, be with us as we face our giants today and every day of our life. And Lord, bless all those who have heard this message. And may they be enriched by your word. And may this word add meaning and understanding to their life and ways of being a disciple. In your heavenly name we pray. Amen. I want to thank you for taking the time to tune in to join me for this week's message. I can see that I'm over my 30 limit, 30 minute limit, but I said at the beginning for joining me for 30 to 40 minutes. So I still got some time. I still got some time. But anyway, I want to thank you for joining me and may God bless you. May his love and light shine down upon you today and every day as you go out into the world facing those giants with confidence, with faith and trust and doing what God is calling you to do. And maybe it wouldn't hurt to carry around a slingshot and a single stone. You'll never know when those things may come in handy to fight those giants in your life. Just don't hurt anybody, okay? Don't hurt anybody. Again, God bless you. And may God love you today and every day until we meet again. Amen.